Good day to all of you who are joining um, today's important program. The most important resource that's deployed by Jewish communal organizations is its people. Attracting and retaining the right talent means creating supportive and engaging cultures within workplaces and creating opportunities for growth and mentorship. There are two recent surveys that point the way forward in this regard. For the second year in a row, Leading Edge conducted a sector-wide employee engagement survey called, Are Jewish Organizations Great Places to Work? Employees from 68 Jewish organizations answered questions about their experience at work, specifically relating to workplace culture, the factors that drive their engagement at work, and the elements that contribute most to, the, to their desire to stay at their organizations and within the Jewish nonprofit sector. JPRO Network also polled professionals in the Jewish nonprofit sector to learn about their networking and career development needs. And they are piloting programs based on the responses to this survey. One of these pilots called Well Advised is providing further data about the needs of early and mid-career professionals. Together, these surveys and the initial learnings from the Well Advised pilot are identifying ways that Jewish funders can transform their organizations, their foundations, and the whole Jewish communal sector to become a field with greater appeal, improved levels of excellence, and more opportunity. We know if we invest in this asset, we will all benefit, enabling Jewish professionals to do their best work and, ach and achieve greater impact in the world. I am delighted that we have the opportunity to hear from Leading Edge and the JPRO network together because their work is so strongly complementary and their professional and lay leaders have been fostering close collaboration. The two organizations see their work as, as mutually reinforcing. One way that they describe their synchronicity is that Leading Edge's work is top down, focusing on making change starting at the C-suite while JPRO's work is bottom up with a focus on the early and mid career. To, we, are, um, in, we are definitely um, looking forward to hearing our, our speakers today. We have Alana Azen from uh, the JPRO network and Golly Cooks from Leading Edge. Alana will speak first. She um, represents the JPRO network, which is the professional association for those who work in the Jewish nonprofit sector in North America, in the United States and Canada. Before beginning her tenure at JPRO, she served as Director of Exper Experiential Education at the UJA Federation of Greater Toronto, where she was part of the founding staff team at Repair the World, and she concluded her tenure there as Executive Vice, Vice President. She lives in Toronto with her husband Eli and their two young children. Golly Cooks is the founding Executive Director of Leading Edge an organization formed in 2014 by foundations and federations to influence, inspire, and enable dramatic change in attracting, developing, and retaining top talent for Jewish organizations. Gali's professional experience spans the public, private, and nonprofit sectors. Um, so I am going to turn it over first to Alana, um, but before I do that, I just wanna reinforce um, the message that Tamara shared, which is if you have any questions that you'd like to um, ask of, of our speakers or to one another, you can please use the Zoom webinar chat um, and I will try to um, collect all of the questions during the course of the presentations and then share them with our presenters af after they conclude their presentations. So Alana, over to you. Thank you so much. Um, I first want to thank Samantha, Tamar, and Andres for inviting me to participate today. And I want to acknowledge Jeff Finkelstein, JPRO's extraordinary president, who is also on the call. Sally Cooks has been the consummate colleague in every way from the moment that I started at JPRO Network, and I am so appreciative to her. And I want to thank you all for joining this important conversation. JPRO Network is the organization that is of, by, and for all people who work in the Jewish nonprofit sector in the United States and Canada. We are a membership organization, and currently we have national affiliates representing over 4,200 individual members. I was inspired to join JPRO 18 months ago in part 
because of our unique history and our leadership's appetite for innovation. We carry the history of our field with us. JPRO dates to 1899. At the same time, we are at an inflection point, reinventing our work to serve the people who power our organizations. In fact, we sometimes lovingly refer to ourselves as a 120-year-old startup. I'll begin by briefly introducing JPRO and we'll then turn to our topic for today to share what we are learning about the needs of professionals in the field from JPRO's recent market research and from one of our, from one of our program pilots. JPRO works with and for individuals and the field and our primary modes are connecting and learning. These foci generate in the four quadrants that you see our core program areas. JPRO is in a period of turnaround and our transition wouldn't be possible without the support of many federations and foundations that are providing supplemental funding over and above their membership dues. Along with many foundations that have taken the step of becoming JPRO affiliates, I want to thank the Jim Joseph Foundation and the Maimonides Fund for grants that are making our program pilots possible. Here's a picture of our plan for growth. We are working to triple the number of affiliated organizations over three years. In 2016, we had 95 affiliates, and by 2019, we are working to have at least 300. We absolutely plan and expect to grow exponentially beyond 300 affiliates, and for now, we have our sights set firmly on that target. In early 2017, we knew that to grow the network, we needed to build up the value proposition for JPRO membership we developed a market research poll to help us do just that. Our poll was a tool to determine what would make JPRO compelling and inspiring to our target audience, professionals in the field, particularly those in early and mid-career. The poll was very brief. It took about five minutes to complete. And we asked five types of questions, which you see here, with a focus on number three, preferred offerings. Before I share some of our learnings, I want to offer three pieces of context. First, we have borrowed from design thinking in our approach during our period of reinvention. This poll was a quick and dirty opportunity to hear what our audience does and doesn't want. Second, as such, we did the poll in-house at no cost, so there wasn't a professional evaluator or firm involved. And third, we spread the word broadly, but the responses are most likely not representative of the field as a whole. For example, people who respond to a JPRO poll are likely to be more identified and engaged with the field than the average person employed by a Jewish nonprofit. To get the word out about the poll, we used JPRO's own list, we turned to eJewish philanthropy, and notably to JPRO's local groups. In addition to our national program, programming, which I'll share more about soon, JPRO Network partners with local JPRO groups. These groups build engaged, connected, local professional communities through in-person networking and professional development. The strongest local groups had a great rate of response to the poll. Okay, so now I'm going to turn to the fun part, which is what we learned. First, here's some demographic data. Our 1,020 respondents came from 36 states and six provinces. More than half of our respondents were in their 30s and 40s, what we might approximate as mid-career. We were also pleased to have a strong proportion of responses from professionals in their 20s. In the poll, we focused on testing these eight ideas. There was a brief description attached to each of the headings, so that respondents could really understand each of the options. And we asked about these ideas in two different ways. First, we asked about each idea individually. Would it be of significant value to the respondent or their colleagues? Then we invited the respondent to select their three favorites. Here are the results of the second question. Each bar graph shows the percent of respondents who selected that idea among their top three. In the individual ratings, when respondents were not forced to prioritize, they liked these ideas in roughly the same order. I want to share what I think is an interesting anecdote about our process. We had a huge hopper of ideas 
And the work to narrow down to a reasonable number to test in the poll was very difficult because we wanted to make sure that the best possibilities didn't inadvertently end up on the cutting room floor. Um, and so under the heading of hindsight is 2020, we almost removed skill-based training, the most popular option, while we were puzzling over the much longer list. And I am of course thrilled and relieved that we kept it in. So here's the most exciting part for JPRO. We have built three pilots in direct response to that data. Well advised is the career advising pilot. Master classes are the skill-based trainings pilot and JPRO Online is the online learning pilot. Awards and recognitions have been part of JPRO for nearly five decades, and we're proud to continue that tradition. In master classes, we curate excellent trainings and offer them to JPRO members at a discount. This particular master class was sold out with a waiting list and we're piloting several others. In fact, we are preparing to announce a class in one of the most requested training areas, somebody who Gali actually recommended to me, and the area is advanced Excel skills. JPRO Online gives access to high level discussions with leading thinkers and speakers. We heard in the poll that professionals outside of the largest Jewish communities are hungry for more opportunities of this sort. Zooming back out to the composition of the poll, I've talked about numbers one and three, demographics and preferred offerings, and I now want to briefly share two learnings from the open-ended comments. First, I have some reflections on the tone of the comments, the underlying sentiment that they present in aggregate. We often hear the story of the disaffected professional working in our sector. I don't want to dismiss the real challenges that complaints, work fetches, can surface, but I also want to highlight the significant positive energy that we heard. While somewhat subjective, we coded comments according to their types. The greatest proportion of comments were suggestions, followed by questions and positive feedback. Respondents shared very few concerns. Our interpretation is that there is a core of professionals who are excited to be involved and support the increased vibrancy of our field. Our colleagues from every kind of organization, every community size, and every kind of role want to step up to celebrate and strengthen our field. JPRO will offer more and more opportunities for this kind of constructive participation. Within the comments, we had several people address the need for more mid-career professional development opportunities. JPRO's approach is to be accessible to large numbers of professionals at a low per person cost. We think this complements the advent of several new mid-career fellowships that deeply Seems like the technology for Alana has halted. So I'm just going to send her a quick note that we cannot hear her. And we may turn to Golly. So stand by, Golly, um, to get, get you teed up. And uh, Tamar, if you could just compose a quick, quick note to Alana that her screen is frozen and we'll come back to her um, on the slide where she's left off. So Gali, unmute yourself and we'll get you, we'll get you teed up. Okay, this is actually a great segue because mid-career matters and that's part of the presentation. So it's a nice symbiosis. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm, let me share my screen and then, well, am I able to share my screen if, um, if Alana has her screen? It can, I think the organizer can, yeah, uh, Tamar, if you could unlock uh, Alana's. Yes, unlock the potential. Unlock. That's what we're we're that's, that's what we're aspiring <laughs> to people. do. Golly. Exactly. That's it. That's it. Uh, I'm not sure how to do that, so I'm going to let Tamar figure that out on her end, back end. Okay. 
And I can, I can yeah. begin to talk about, because yeah, as Alana has said, we, uh, JPro and Leading Edge have, have really enjoyed for the last 18 months, um, and really before Alana as well, a really nice, um, nice relationship. And, and uh, it's, it's wonderful to have a colleague in the field who's staying up at night and waking up early in the morning thinking about the same thing. So uh, very much Alana is that person and, and that team and uh, the lay uh, team as well. And um, so just a pleasure to, to be playing off of her um, and continuing that discussion. Um, I'm going to just continue flowing with this and, and hope that uh, there's some audiovisual uh, unlocking that happens. Um, as, as in seeing the RSVPs for the webinar, uh, my sense is that uh, most of you have heard the Genesis story of Leading Edge, which is not, uh, which is much shorter than JPro, since we're not 120 years old or so. We're three, three years old. So, um, so one sec, Gali. Yeah. Apparently, sure. I've been informed you are able to share your presentation. Then. I am. Okay. Yeah. So, okay. Tamar, if you could just um, join in and explain exactly what she should be doing to do that. Oh, I think. Did I do it? You did it. All right. I should have just tried. Okay, great. Well done. Um, a lesson there, never ask for permission, just do, right? No. Um, okay, let me, let me go ahead. Um, so as, as uh, I, I would suspect many uh, on the call have, have heard um, as, as we uh, enjoy the partnership and our founding parents, if you will, are JFN members, including, um, including Andres uh, as one of our founders and board members. You've heard the Genesis story, but we always like to go back to the why and, and what is the problem that we're trying to solve uh, as it relates to talent and leadership in our sector. And we like to frame uh, the problem in these terms in that there, there are, uh, by some estimates, uh, 9,500 Jewish organizations. Oh, and I see Alana is, she's back. Okay, so I'm gonna stop sharing. Um, unless Samantha or, or uh, Tamara, you think it's, we should proceed I, as is with Alana. Alana, if you can keep going, I don't know where you were, if it's... Sure. Mid-career, mid-career. Mid-career, there we are. Perfect, I'm so sorry about the technical glitch. It happens. Okay, perfect. All right, I'm hoping that my, my slide back up. Yeah, they are. Yes. All right, perfect. So I was just turning to the third section of my presentation, which is to share about Well Advised, a program that offers free advising to JPRO members and is also a learning laboratory for the needs of professionals. The Well Advised program pilot began in January of this year and will run through June. It offers JPRO members one hour, one time advising that they can sign up for quickly and easily online. We have 14 volunteer advisors, three of whom you see on the slide, and all of, you, all of whom are listed on the JPRO Well Advised website. Our goal for the pilot was to have at least 50 advising sessions and we are more than two thirds of the way there. There is a menu of 16 advising topics, all of which you see here, and we designed the um, pilot for many outcomes, including the following. We wanted to meet advisees' real-time needs and enable them to identify concrete next steps related to a specific professional challenge. And we want to work to build a field-wide culture of support and giving back. The name, Well Advised, created by my brilliant colleague, Erica Goldman, who is the other half of the JPRO staff, is meant to evoke not only good advice, but also drawing from the well of wisdom that exists in our community of colleagues. So advisees sign up for a session, they choose one topic, and they answer some intake questions about their situation and goals so they can make the most of the hour. Here are our focus areas for learning during the pilot. Numbers one and two are really internal to JPRO. They're to learn about the program. And my focus right now is on number three, field level learning. We are collecting a lot of information that can help all of us to understand the needs of our workforce. We're just over three months into the pilot, so the data set is very much growing and evolving. And what you'll see now is just a snapshot. So I do wanna caution against drawing any conclusions just yet. 
Part of what's exciting to us about learning from well-advised is that unlike our market research and many other forms of research, which ask people to predict their behavior or give opinions, this data is drawn from professionals' actual use of the program. They are signing up for something they want, so it's an excellent barometer of actual needs. So here's the first of three slides that show you some data from well-advised. In the intake form, we ask advisees how many years of professional experience they have, and we're really pleased to be meeting the needs of early career professionals, those with 10 and fewer years of experience. And we're also seeing that interest in well-advised continues well into one's career. Now I'm gonna turn from the who to the what. We spent a lot of time honing the menu of advising topics. And of course, we were very interested in which topics would resonate with our users. We have been really struck that nearly two thirds of the requests have been for next steps in my career and path to promotion. At the same time, we don't wanna dismiss that one third of the need is being met by a wide range of topics, each in small portion. And now I'm gonna to turn to a final slide which shows the relationship between the topics requested and years of professional experience. Here we see the average years of experience for the subgroup that requested a particular topic. For example, those who requested preparing for or returning from leave have an average of eight years of experience, so far at least. At this early stage and with relatively small data set, we see that, it, that requests for advising about supervision and performance, performance improvements skew later in career, and that those in early career are asking for help with resume review, managing time and energy, and preparing for a negotiation. So even though it's too early to draw conclusions, we see an opportunity, as well advised grows, to learn not only about the kind of professional development and support that our community of colleagues wants, but also when they most need it. I'm looking forward to learning from Gali, and Gali, thank you so much for pinch hitting. Um, and I'm also looking forward to addressing any questions during the Q&A. Thank you all so much for your interest in JPerm Network. Fabulous, thank you, Alana. We're glad you were able to return. Um, <laughs> Gali, please. Okay, all right, wonderful. Uh, and Alana, while you were out in um, IT difficulty land, which it doesn't seem like we have a webinar without them these days, um, just wanted to thank you for your partnership and uh, just say how um, the, there's a mutual flan club going. So um, it's, uh, it's really fun to be doing this together. Um, so going back to our Genesis story, just the, the framing of the problem and, and the market sizing, if you will, um, we estimate, and, and this is from some research that if anyone's interested, happy to share, that there are 9,500 Jewish organizations in the United States. Of those, about 75% to 90% are going to be needing new CEOs in the next five to seven years. Now that five to seven year stat actually originates with JFN, who was pretty, uh, pretty prescient in that in 2009, there was a monograph put out about the um, succession planning types of challenges based on demographic shifts in the United States that are impacting everybody. And um, Michael Austin and Tracy Selkowitz went out and they asked a bunch of CEOs of Jewish organizations, how much longer are you gonna stay in your role? And the, the response that came time and time again was five to seven years. Now, I wanna say that this was 2009, a lot happened that year and certainly the Great Recession is something that we are uh, in some ways continuing to bounce back from and, and, uh, um, and therefore there was a lagging type of um, element to this, uh, uh, this kind of exit, if you will. But that essentially, those demographics and those early, the early evidence really of the hardship of finding CEOs to replace these individuals who are leaving were the original pain points that led to the Bridge Brand Report, which also was released at a JFN conference um, in 2014, um, which tried to understand why is it so difficult to hire for these roles when you've got organizations that are trying to solve some of the most interesting and meaty problems in our society, uh, whether it be federations or health and human services organizations or whatever organizations make up the, the tapestry of our Jewish community, there is a real um, hardship in that. And there were two themes that 
were identified based on about 160 or so interviews. Uh, my sense is looking on the RSVP list that some of you who RSVP'd and are on this call were actually interviewed for these, so thank you for the um, early contribution to Leading Edge's work. There were two themes. One, we actually have a tremendous pipeline of folks. Alana just mapped out about uh, the understanding of the field. These are people who are positive and um, certainly willing and ready, but they're not necessarily able to take over these roles because we haven't developed them. So you've got people who are raising their hands and saying like, pick me, pick me. And those individuals are not qualified to lead CEO, to be CEOs in these organizations because we haven't given them the opportunities to really stretch and grow. So that was the first theme that really popped uh, from this report. The other one had to do, if we pull back and just look at our Jewish nonprofit sector in general, these 9,500 Jewish organizations, there was this theme that emerged that it almost went to like an image problem within the Jewish community, that there was this lack of attracting ability of Jewish organizations of top talent when they made decisions about where to go in their career and Again, Alana pointed out to the fact that we are all thinking about in some way, what's next, what's next? And what is the attraction force that our Jewish nonprofits really have to be able to say, come and work here because you're gonna maximize your potential, you're gonna grow in some way. And this report pointed to the fact of a lack of a value proposition. So that when someone had a choice point, they could go to a Teach for America, let's say, or they could go to a Jewish day school, and I don't mean to pick on anyone, but it was th that kind of choice point, we had to look at, well, what's our value proposition in the Jewish nonprofit way? And from these interviews, there was this lackluster type of value proposition. So out of that uh, came Leading Edge, and we work in three distinct areas, and, and this is something that Samantha mentioned in her intro of us. We look at executive leadership and, and look at that CEO role because there are at minimum 7,000 CEOs who are gonna to need to be churning through the ranks if we look at the 9,500 and that 75% churn rate. So let's look at those new CEOs and how we might be able to support them and what that, those migratory patterns look like because great organizations start at the top. They may be amazing as well in, in, uh, in a more holistic way and ultimately the buck stops and potentially starts with the leader. So how can we support the leadership? Lay leadership as the partner, uh, we, we are often um, looking at that lay pro partnership, which is unique to the nonprofit sector, and thinking about ways to strengthen that relationship and make it healthy. Because when it's healthy, one plus one equals three. I mean, it can really be magical. When it's not, which is too often, it is, can be really, really destructive. So how might we be able to improve that? And then the third, and this is gonna be the meat of uh, some of the data that again, Samantha mentioned that we've been looking at is culture. So the day-to-day -day of an organization is something that we believe, and this is something that research, research says, is a massive lever that we might be able to attract great talent. And so what does a great place to work look like? Are Jewish organizations great places to work? Because as Peter Drucker would say and has said, culture eats strategy for breakfast. So we, we sometimes have amazing strategies, but if we don't have the people in the right roles with the right policies, practices, procedures, and wind at their back to make that, make that strategy come to life, it's not going to see the light of day. And that's culture. So what is uh, a great place to work. And there actually is a great place to work institute, which um, is, that's a whole other story. They're wonderful and also quite difficult to work with. So we, we looked at what a leading place to work is essentially, because we also believe that great, you don't just reach great. It's always going to be a striving type of thing. This is going to be a constant thing that organizations have to work at. And so we look at five elements really, and this is based on literature review of all of the literature. And there is a lot of it around workplace culture and some of the, the elements that are key to helping people maximize our potential at work. And these are the five. They're, it starts with trusted leaders. There needs to be a common and shared purpose, a really clear one. So people are hungering for vision and mission. Respected employees is, is in some ways the really heart and soul of a great place to work. There needs to be mutual respect and trust, and there's a bedrock of trust um, that is inherent in a leading place to work. There's also an understanding that people constantly grow. And therefore, we need to continue to develop them and invest in them. And that element of talent and development is, is really key. And then there's another type of investment, which is salary and benefits. 
And that's something that when there is uh, not a lot of transparency around and is a black box can turn into something that does not lend itself to a leading place to work. So looking at organizations, compensation philosophy and how they talk about different um, elements of the more concrete ways that you invest in people is, is a part and parcel of a great place to work as well, or a leading place to work. So as Samantha mentioned, we did do an employee engagement survey um, in 2016 and 17. We actually, on Tuesday, launched our 2018 one. So um, it, we're excited to get those results. And we hope that this is going to be something that institutes a new habit in our community, asking your employees for feedback, because that is the best way to know, are people engaged with, in their work and are they able to do their work? That's really what it comes down to. So these results that we're going to uh, talk about now come from um, our 2017 report, which again, as Samantha mentioned, is um, a collection of data from about 68 organizations, about 4,500 employees. So there's good news and bad news. I'll just, I'll save you the 48 pages of reports and, um, and graphics and whatnot. The good news is we have pride and mission. So this, in, in many ways, what Alana was talking about, people are really like, they're in it. There's a certain there's a certain flame, if you will, that are in people's bellies and um, it's driving their day-to-day -day in ways that are meaningful and in ways that are really powerful and a cut above the rest. Like this is, if we're comparing ourselves against the general industry and let's say our, our other competition, other companies and organizations, uh, we really do have this in spades. However, however, more than half of our employees want to leave our sector in the next five years. Now, this is something that's keeping me up at night personally, because it means that half of us on this call in the next five years are out. And that is distressing because it also means that something's happening in the now and we're not able to really maximize our potential in the now. So let's try to get at that. And so we tried to. So let's first look at the upside and then we'll look at the downside and what funders can do as, as a result. We mentioned the pride thing. Um, mission is incredible. Like we really do have it from a value proposition perspective what we offer employees and the chance to come to work 40 hours a week or 60, if we're really gonna be honest, this is, this is something that people actually want. We make a difference in the world. 84% of respondents said, you know what? I really understand how I'm making a difference in my day to day, that's huge. And more than that, 92% said, I understand how my work contributes to our mission, strategy, and goals. Whew, that's incredible. If you think of 4,500 employees across everyone, this isn't just like, you know, the C-suite or, <clears throat> or <clears throat> senior leaders talking this way. Now, <clears throat> this is huge also because if we're bringing demographics in again, by 2025, 75% of the workforce will be millennials. They will. They're already here and, and, and among us and leading us in many different ways. And this is a generation that puts a premium on purpose in ways that previous ones have never. And so when we talk about the value proposition of like how are we gonna be able to attract the best and the brightest, the fact that we have purpose is huge. So go us in many ways. However, however, we talked about the exit and the fact that there is a, uh, a looking at uh, leaving of organizations and sector. So we asked different questions about willingness to stay or, or um, anticipation of staying within the survey. I want to concentrate on this 55% because it's the entire sector. It's the 9,500. It's as if you're going, to you're going to leave your industry and change industries in many ways. And that's something that um, is not good in many ways. So why? Why do people cite they want to leave? Well, we asked that. We said, what would be your top three reasons for leaving your current role and the sector? So there are three. Compensation, career development, work-life balance. Now, these are standard. If you were to do any sort of analysis of exit interviews, and we have a meta-analysis of that, these are the top three reasons that people cite for, this is why I left. Mm, however, 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 what we did was a gap analysis. We said there's a bunch of people who said, I'm staying in the field. And there are a bunch of people who said, I'm leaving the first chance I get. And there has to be a gap between what the stayers perhaps have that the leavers, those who said they, leaving, they are leaving, don't have. These are the, the biggest gaps within the questions, and there were about 65 questions, so these are the top seven, I believe, yep, seven questions, where there are the biggest gaps. Notice what's not here. Compensation, career advancement, 
to some extent, work-life work balance is because we're talking about care and concern. We're talking about leadership. We're talking about the tone that leaders set in their organizations. That is at the heart. That's the key driver that keeps people within their organizations and also drives them away. Leadership matters. It really, really does. Now we actually have the data. Alana, you're here. This was, this was a fun slide to put together. One of the ways we want to support leaders at Leading Edge and, and hopefully the community is by creating a shift for, for all of us, really, of expectation, understanding that the work that we have to do with, within society is hard. It's change management. It's not maintenance mode in any way, shape, or form. So can we shift our thinking, which too often is... Welcome, Alana. Prove to us we hired the right person. To welcome, Alana. How can we support your leadership? And can we do that at every level of our organizations? And that's where we have a leadership development program for new CEOs, so like Alana, and um, and I think that Todd is on this call as well. Uh, these are that's what we're trying to do is let's create a supportive environment for you to be able to learn the context and really lead an organization because as we saw from the previous slide leaders matter now managers matter as well so when we look at people's just wanting to leave one of the things that is fundamental to any organization is good management and there are fundamentals of management and we don't have them from a basic hygiene type of perspective in that people, less than half of people actually had an annual performance review. So we're not even talking about the constant loop of an annual performance review that was meaningful, which is uh, certainly can be improved. And then even fewer people actually had some sort of feedback loop that was ongoing. Now, the reason why this is important is if you look at a formula for creating a top-notch professional, if not leader, it's this which is from the Center for Creative Leadership. It's literally the secret sauce, which is not so secret. It's 70% of it is on the job, work experience, stretching yourself every day. It's kind of like getting into shape and, and being able to reach new, new challenges and build new habits because every day you're practicing and you're stretching maybe 1% more, 1% more, 1% more. If we don't have the management fundamentals, that 70% is certainly not being optimized. And it's certainly not at a place where it needs to be. The other 20% is feedback, relationships, mentoring, networking, coaching, which as a community, some people have great access to, other people don't necessarily. And then there's the 10% in the classroom or let's send you to a conference to learn something new. But that 70% is part of the fundamentals that we don't have. Now, the last piece that was really glaring for us as we looked at the results last year is that people are really stretched thin. It's, it's something that uh, really popped for us even more than the general nonprofit sector when we compare ourselves to general nonprofit sector, not Jewish, and then general industry as well. Now, the reason why this is so important is that we have to ask ourselves if people feel like there are not enough people to do the work, if they feel, if I go back to the, the last slide, that the workloads are not fair, because what we hear from the field is that if you do a good job, you're going to get more work to do and not necessarily have something moved off your plate, then there's a question about, well, how conscious are we at work? Are we just responding? Are we forcing our employees to be on automatic pilot and just automatically moving very fast into the work when we know that our community has problems and challenges and opportunities that need a different kind of solution? They're there are complex decisions that need to be made. Now, this is, this is um, from Daniel Kahneman's uh, Behavioral Economist who talks about the different ways that intuition and, um, and I guess higher level thinking play into people's making decisions. And he contends that system two is one that's a little bit slower, that is, that is used to uh, solve some of the higher level types of problems that our leaders are, in a sense, needing to solve. So what is the environment that can condition itself to be able to contribute that? Now, when we look at what contributes to people being thin or stretched thin, there are three layers that we hypothesize it being. One is management. We know we don't have management fundamentals, but a good manager is going to help you prioritize. 
Now, this is for some research that Google did when they said managers really don't matter. And then they actually found the data to say, actually, they really, really do matter. So a good manager is going to help you prioritize. That's one way to get people not so stretched thin. The second, the board. Strategy. What's the strategy of the organization? And specifically, what are you saying no to? Because that's at the heart of strategy, that focus. And what we've heard from so many organizations is that they don't say no to anything. They take on new, 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 new. And sometimes that's the funders urging. And the, the, the plate just gets fuller and fuller and there's a breakage point. So we work with boards and try to think about, um, and we'll be doing more of that around strategy. And the third is funders. And understanding that going back to Samantha's point earlier, if we are a sector made up of individuals, professionals who are the greatest asset in that, they are the ones carrying out the programs and services. So the people are the asset. If we invest in them, they will appreciate. And by investing in them, that means that things like salary and benefits are not pejorative. They're not. They are the crux of the product. They're not the nice to have. Now, our friends at uh, um, uh, Grant Makers for Effective Organizations have done a lot of research around investing in leadership, and, uh, and I know Samantha's team is, is very much in, um, in partnership with them working on that as well. And there are different ways for funders to potentially support leaders and different questions that can be asked, and there's, there's a spectrum uh, of an ability to, to not only invest in individuals, and that could potentially be through fellowships, as, as we've seen a lot of those cropping up, um, and certainly as grantees of, of funders looking at ways that, um, uh, that funders can build the capacity of their organizations. Um, so happy to talk about that further. And this is a, a matrix that um, has come from some of the I would say the, the deepest leadership funders um, released recently that was a helpful way of understanding some of the different interventions that could be made. Now, all of this leads to, in effect, our having, when we look at talent and the picture of talent in our sector, a middle dip of engagement. So what ends up happening is that people come into our sector early career and they're very, very happy and engaged in their work. And then there's sort of like a sophomore slump and it happens for us sooner and it's more steep than in other industries. And then there's this like really, really difficult middle when there aren't necessarily a lot of supports and a lot of um, frustration for professionals. And then there's an uptick and the uptick can be for a num number of reasons, which is fun to debate and I'm happy to do that with anyone. Now, what we're seeing as we are starting to map the field, and I should say right now, this is not a complete mapping of leadership development and professional development programs, um, and yet it represents some of the ones that have been introduced in the, net, in the last three years and also fill a specific niche. So if you look at specifically the lowest point, I would contend that JPRO fills a tremendously important need because there isn't a lot of intervention there, and in many ways that's the, the place where you could intervene and stop a lot of this exit and, and the bleeding, if you will, that we're having of professionals, especially the top talent. And so it's interesting to see what types of fellowships, and, and in some ways that's the 20% and the 10%, it's not the 70%, um, are, are being introduced by different foundations, by major institutions that are leadership factories and seeing where is there potential for more, deeper, better, potentially lack of duplication and all of that. Now, all of this is to say that our work really is, the heart of it is this shift that we see about just the changing nature of work in general. The Jewish community, just like the rest of society, is trying to contend with this shift from a career ladder type of structure where many multinational corporations, if we think of um, even like retailers or, or uh, some of the bigger companies that have been very, very clear about a ladder progression, into this new-ish, uh, more open lattice type of framework. And this is something that in 2009, Deloitte was like, you know what, the ladder is dead. The corporate ladder is dead. It's all about the lattice. And so organizations need to have really reorganize to be able to accommodate the different migratory patterns of talent. Or as Sheryl Sandberg would say, a career is a jungle gym. It's not a ladder. 
And so we have as leaders, as funders, as people who are either managing ourselves or other people or at the board table, how do we reorient um, our organizations to really be able to, to address that? And it starts in these conversations, literally these conversations. I wish that there was a, by the way, a graphic where it wasn't two men, but we'll get to that later. But it, these conversations of understanding that it's not just about the today, it's also about the investment that we'll appreciate and compound in the future. And it's in our hands to be able to change that and do that now. So, stop sharing. Hey, thank you, Gali. All right, terrific. So we are going to try to open up the lines and allow people to uh, ask questions. And while we're doing that, I'm going to um, kick off a couple of questions and have you both respond. Really, really terrific. Um, and just by the way, too, we're going to post those presentations up on the JFM website. So uh, I don't know if you both were able to get through your entire presentations, but people can review the material afterwards. I know that they both had a lot of information in them. So um, I one question that I have in listening to you is um, that, that slide, Golly, that you showed about the transition that's expected over the next five to seven years with, you know, north of three quarters of CEOs leaving um, and retiring um, and the pipeline to fill them is running dry. So for the folks on the call here, you know, for the professionals in the field who obviously care a lot about the work that they're doing and feel deeply fulfilled by the mission of our work, how can we be prepared for the transition? And, you know, what, what should folks, folks be thinking about to take the mantle, to get ready to take the mantle? And I think this is for both of you, if you so I don't know who wants to, to kick it off. Yeah, Alana, do, 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 you can go ahead if you want. Um, I'll offer one thought, Gali. I know you, you spend um, many, many of your hours thinking about this, so I'm sure you'll have more to say. But, um, I, you know, I thought a lot about the statistics that Gali shared from the Center for Creative Leadership showing that 70% of what we learn is on the job. Part of what we heard at JPRO when I was on my early listening tour, which actually led to the skill-based training um, initiative, our, our master classes, is that we heard from people around five to eight years of career that working in the Jewish nonprofit sector, they felt like they were being prepared well to be generalists, but they weren't developing a lot of deep skills. Um, and I'll just speak anecdotally from my own experience. I have worked exclusively in the Jewish world for, I don't know, upwards of 15 years now. If our workplaces are not, um, if we are not immersed in the water of the kind of skill development and excellence, if, if that's not in our workplaces, we don't pick it up along the way. So I don't have advanced Excel skills and I'm excited for the course because I haven't worked in environments where that was the norm. When I became a supervisor, I woke up one morning and I was a supervisor. It was like a magic wand was tapped on my head because that, that was just how it was. And so, um, you know, I think part of preparing ourselves is making sure that we're, we're learning on the jobs, we're seeking the opportunities, we're pushing the culture at whatever level we're at, but also recognizing that we do have to sometimes go outside to get the training, to get the experience, to really be able to take a hard look at where are my gaps if I want to be able to take on, um, you know, more se senior leadership positions. Thank you. Ditto. No, ditto. like <laughs> seriously, echoing that. For, for people who are in the pipeline, it's up to you to take the initiative to develop yourself in whatever way you feel you've got growing edges. And that's, that's been the clearest evidence that we've seen that there is a, a almost like a mentality of feed me in the, in the workplace that has to shift. You have to take some responsibility for your own professional development. And what we do is we work with CEOs and, and really managers to not stifle that growth because that happens all too often in our workplaces as well. But one, so one piece of advice would say, you know, if you do aspire to be uh, a leader and, and whatever that title might be, take initiative to be able to, to learn whatever you think is going to be uh, really your, your growing edge. And it's, it's funny that we talk about Excel because in my first six months of leading edge, I did a listening and learning tour where I consumed so much coffee. It was like unhealthy. And I asked people, what are the top three things that you want to, that you need in order to, to succeed? Like 
really develop as a leader. So they said, one, public speaking. I need to understand how to tell stories in a way that, that matter better. Two, excel because I'm scared of it. And I know that reading budgets and making pivot tables and doing all those types of things are really important, at least for me to be able to ask questions about and not be completely blindsided by. And the third was fundraising, like being really there to be able to nurture a prospect, to make the ask, to get the no and get a lot of the no's and just have those types of um, scabs, if you will, so that when I actually have to go, um, I'm going to be able to have at least those types of experience to draw from. So that would be my biggest advice is, is um, for individuals. Look, they're the funders who we obviously think of, can we create a different environment, literally remake the ecosystem so that people don't have to necessarily advocate for themselves as much. Uh, that's a longer play. But in the here and now, people can absolutely, you know, Google whatever they need and then YouTube whatever they need to learn um, and make it, make it for themselves. Fabulous. Great advice. Um, we have a question, um, actually a few, from our um, audience out there. So one question we have is, what are your, your dreams? Your, each of you lead organizations that are empowering others to lead. So for the two of you as executive directors of really formative organizations that, golly, for you, you're just two, two three years in, and Alana, you're 99 years in, or even more maybe. Um, what are the dreams for your organizations? What do you wish you could be tackling that you can't do today? So say maybe your horizon of five to seven years, what, what do you wanna be working on going forward? Sure. Oh my God. This is like the, the, the most fun question ever. I think there's some, there, there are serious uh, levers that if they were to be, I don't know, pushed upon, I'm not sure what the right uh, verb is, that if somehow we were able to augment, that would turn around everything. I mean, really would lever and, and, and all of that. So one in my dream state, uh, funders would give the opportunity to leaders to invest their resources in whatever way they saw fit in order to achieve their mission. And I have to say, as, as one who was on the funding side of the, of the table as well, working at the Reed and Stanley Kaplan Family Foundation for six years, and now on the other side of the, of the table where it's, it's a little bit different because we're funder collaborative, so our funders are incredibly generous to the point where I need to pinch myself sometimes, there's, there is this dance that happens between being able to um, get the necessary resources to just get the operation up and running so that overhead type of funding and capacity building kind of funding and and funders who have specific niche areas that um, could be totally in the bullseye of an organization and also really distracting to an organization. So in my perfect worldview, there would be some sort of synergy and, and a real symbiosis between the, the funder and the grantee in a way that um, right now um, happens and and um, but not enough i guess um, so that would be one thing the second would be uh, serious investment in in better leadership team type of development one of the problems that we have in the in the jewish community and this is writ large also the the mental model of a leader of the 20th century is someone who's like the sage on the stage the savior the unicorn these people don't exist and to be able to then invest in, um, you know, Joe Canfer introduced me to this, this concept of uh, leadership molecule. Like we are dealing with very complex types of problems in the Jewish nonprofit sector and any of us in the social sector. And that means that we need complementary individuals to come together and become a unit to be able to solve that problem. So if funders can facilitate that type of leadership team uh, and foster that collaboration, that would be to use one of my favorite words, magical. And the third is better managers. Like it's, it's better managers make better organizations and having the ability to really invest in that, give people the opportunity to uh, recognize the value of, of better management and enabling somebody else to maximize their potential. I think those three things uh, would be out of business and, and I'd be very happy for it. Terrific. Alana, how about you? Um, of course, I, I, I ditto everything that Gali said, and I'll say that sort of the, the big dream 
I think the long play is that uh, Gali used the word magnetism, right? That the attractive force of our sector, the real um, experience and perception that this is the best place to work. Um, you know, I think the question is how do we get to that place where we are recruiting, retaining and training people with excellence, you know, top, 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 top talent. That's, that's what's gonna make our organizations effective. So, um, you know, sort of conceptually, how are we gonna do that? I think there are a couple of ways we need to, to raise the bar. One is I really wanna echo what Gali said about supervision. It is frankly inexcusable for organizations to have senior managers and managers that do not have training and support about how to manage, to have, how to manage. We have to get to a place where our organizations have the time and the resources and the commitment to invest in this. And I would say paired with that is that professional development cannot be the first thing that we cut when we're budgeting every year. Everybody, you know, at every level has to have resources to invest in themselves. And that has to be paired with the performance review where we're actually setting goals and growing ourselves in ways that support the organization and that invest in the individual. I think beyond that, how do we build a culture in our field where everyone is on the inside, where there isn't a sense that some people have more of a voice and more of a seat at the table than others? And, and for me, that relates to um, a conversation about diversity and how do we increase and embrace the diversity of our workforce. And uh, you know, along many, many, many axes, including um, I've, I've spent time in some mid-sized and smaller communities where folks say, you know, half of our workforce is not Jewish. Is JPRO just for people who are Jewish? And, you know, I emphasize that we are for everyone who works in the sector, but sort of like, you know, how, how do we tell that story that everyone who works in our organizations is equal? Um, and so for JPRO specifically, you know, what do we wish we could be tackling that we aren't right away? We think that we're onto some things and we want to be able to scale them, to be able to offer them, as I said before, to large numbers of professionals at lower cost. I think that we're, we're developing models that are scalable, scalable, so we're excited to be able to do that. And the other thing that um, in different moments of JPRO's 120 year history has been a large part of what we do is around convening, bringing professionals together. So whether locally, regionally, or nationally, we are eager to do that because we think it, it builds a real sense of um, electricity, right? Of, of professional community that can be broadcast out. If 500, 1,000 professionals are getting together to have these conversations, it not only helps them, but it creates a story that we can um, broadcast to our, our much wider community of colleagues. All right, terrific. I want to thank you both for delivering extraordinary presentations and for just stimulating a fantastic conversation. I know I feel like we could go on and on. This is really important work and um, the entire sector writ large indeed is going to benefit from the work that you're both providing. So um, with that said, I'm going to uh, say goodbye to all. We're going to post these presentations on our website and the report that Golly mentioned is from Grantmakers for Effective Organizations and we will find a link to that as well so that we can post it for you um, to see. Um, so I'm sure that this is not the the end of these conversations with the both of you and we look forward to continued um, engagement and dialogue. Thanks again. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.